Well, hello there, everyone. How are you? Thank you so much for um, letting Thea and I come and talk to you both uh, today. As um, Jess introduced, my name is Victoria Entwistle. I lead our internal comms practice um, at H&K. Before that, I was at BT, leading internal comms for BT Sport and BT TV. Um, one of the reasons why I love H&K is that we have this fantastic offer in behavioural science. And Theo and I work closely every day on a kind of employee engagement projects and change management projects. And we thought we would love to share with you some of the things that we've learned and also to get some thoughts from you. So if you're not on the Wi-Fi yet, I would ask you to go onto the Wi-Fi. The details are there. If you're familiar with a technology called Slido, there's an app. It's literally Slido. If not, then you go to the website sly.do. There's no com, there's no UK, it's literally slide.do. And as we work our way through, we'll give you an event code and want to get you talking and sharing your views as well. So I'm going to introduce Thea, who'll tell you a little bit more about what she does um, at H&K. Lovely. Thanks, Vicky. So uh, my name's Thea, and I'm part of H&K Smarter. And we are the specialised behavioural science unit. And we take understandings from economics, neuroscience, sociology, and apply those to the real life challenges of human behaviour. And that's a lot of what we're going to be talking about today. So what we're going to do is take you through a little bit of why really the workplace can feel quite an alien place to us. Um, so Thea's going to take you through a little bit of the history of the workplace and then we're going to get some thoughts and feedback from you and share some insights and science and studies that kind of show really um, why humans may find being at work a little bit challenging. So I might just take the uh, yeah, clicker there. Sure. So, throughout human history, for the most of the time we've been on this earth, this has been our workplace. This is where we were born to live and work. And then, uh, we decided to create cities, and humans being humans, we innovated, we created homes for ourselves. And then we decided in the mid-18th century to create what we now call an office. And that office was very much created based on the idea of a factory. So we really wanted to maximize kind of industrial productivity. And I would argue, in a large part, this hasn't really changed. We still go to the same place every day, and we work the same number of hours with the same people. But is this really the right way to thrive within the environment that we're at so often throughout the day? So we wanted to think back what were we promised about the workplace? If we think back a few decades ago, all the futurists had some ideas. And good old George Jetson, he only worked two days a week for two hours a day. And I don't know about you, but that's very far from my work experience. <laughs> and he went home and his robot maid had already done all of his laundry and all of his housework for him. But in reality, the more technology we seem to have, the more anxious we are the more we seem to work. The more comfort we have, the more that we expect. So what is it about the evolution of the workplace and how can we be really realistic about our human nature and how we can thrive in our workplace? So we've talked a bit about the history and we're thinking a little bit about the future. And what do we want to talk about today is some of the research and the science about what it is to be human and how we can thrive. So, although we'd like to be able to deal with all our customers' demands and reply to all the emails in our day, effectively, there's only so much energy that we have. And our brain is still kind of old. Although we've created all of these technologies, our brain is still coming up, like coming to terms with it and evolving over time. So we have kind of a cognitive capacity that we need to be aware of. So there's only so many hours that we can work in a day, and we kind of wanted to find out how many is that? So, as I mentioned, we want to get your participation. So, hopefully, you've got onto the Wi Fi, a show of hands generally, and you found, brilliant, you found Sly.do. So, I'll give you the event code it is H465. So, hopefully, you can find that. And maybe kind of nod vigorously or wave your hands if you're into the Creativity Plus page. Are we there yeah? Good, 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 nice. okay. Great. And then there's a polling section. So we're going to be asking you a few questions and we want your feedback. If you can't get online, don't worry, we accept shout outs, so that's fine. So um, just give us, uh, give us your thoughts, but we'd really like to, to hear from you. So 
as we said, we kind of talked through kind of the strange world. We really are kind of forest dwelling creatures, but we are environments. And probably hot this week, you may have seen Francis O'Grady, the Secretary General of the TUC, talking about the possibility of a four day week. Not the Jetsons Nirvana that we'd heard about kind of uh, when I was at school, but by the end of this century that we could be working a four day week. So, what does that mean? Well, Basically, um, we currently work generally 40, five, five days a week. And you may not realize that actually it was Ford that introduced the five-day week. Everyone used to work 48 hours a week until Ford, when their production, discovered that actually their employees were far more productive working five days than they were 48 hours. So where Ford leads, the world follows, and they introduced the five day week and since then that's kind of where we have the traditional model that we have now. So thinking about Francis O'Grady, thinking about that news this week about the four day week, your first poll should be asking you how does working a four day week impact productivity? I want your thoughts. Do you think we'll be more productive? Do you think we'll stay the same level pegging? Or do you think we just can't do it? We need to work five days and we will be actually less productive. So if we can hit to Slido, we should be able to see your thoughts live. All right. I think we've got some um, optimists in the, off in the audience <laughs> today. This is great. All right, so what we do know in terms of what academic studies have shown us is that working more than 40, hour, uh, 40 hours does you no good whatsoever. Not only because you've got a lot of extra stress within the work environment, that's often unavoidable. You also have, practically, the more time you spend at work, the less time you have looking after yourself and your family. So those extra hours are the hours that you'd actually probably spend looking after your body, making sure you're eating what you need to eat, and spending quality time with the people that bring you kind of joy in your life. So we know that for sure. When it comes to, is the four day week the number one answer in terms of like optimal productivity? If we can go now to the, uh, the answer slide, the answer is there's absolutely no impact on productivity when you move to a four day week within a specific study that we found. So this study done in our little old revolutionary New Zealand uh, looked at two months where they moved employees from a five day week to a four day week and they saw stress to decrease. Um, empowerment increased. People felt like they were really looked after and they obviously, because they had more time, were able to manage kind of their work-life balance a lot better. And then interestingly, when it came to productivity, it had no impact at all. So a few of, them, a few of you in the room might be disappointed because we didn't have an increase in productivity, but at least that didn't change. So the caveats that we have here is there's not too many studies as to we can say that this is the number one option for everyone. For one reason, uh, not all organisations are the same. There's billions of workers out there and some organisations need people in the office at all times. And the other thing is, this was a small study in New Zealand and there's not too many out there. So we need more organisations to uh, be courageous and try and take this on. And we know that Amazon is currently looking to trial a four day week although slightly less generously, only offering 75% of the pay. Well, Amazon have got a million employees, so while their first study is going to be a pilot and obviously targeting a smaller sample, you know, if an organisation like that can prove at scale that this is the case, we may even beat Francis O'Grady's commitment to the end of the century, which I think maybe some of us are, are hoping for. Okay, so we talked about hours of work where to work. So, you know, we are forest dwelling lovers, so where do we prefer to work? So here, I'm going to show you some offices, and which is more you? Are you kind of a wee worker? Do you like to go into kind of a cafe or this rented space where you're working with other creatives? Are you a Google campus? Do you want to have a slide in your office and facilities? Um, do you like to go to work, but you like to shut the door and just be in your own private office? I think that's nirvana for, for some of us. Or do you like to just roll out of bed and your desk is there? So if you go to Slido, you should have the next question and we'd love to, to get a good sample and find out what you guys are like. Nice. Okay. 
So interestingly, I guess, less people who are looking to kind of work from home compared to kind of working with their colleagues. Maybe it's the slide that really pushed everyone. That might be it. <laughs> um, so what we do know is in the last decade or so, a lot of organisations are moving to open plan. And it makes sense in an information kind of economy where you need people to collaborate, to come up with ideas together. Completely makes sense. One study found when they were looking at people who were moving from a, a non-open plan to an open plan, kind of this Google WeWork situation, what they found was um, by studying two Fortune 500 companies is strangely the number of face-to-face -face interactions went down by 70%. And the number of texts and emails went up by 20 to 50%. So although open plan does kind of democratise attention, what it doesn't do is it, is it makes you feel like anyone can hear what you're going to say. And also often, you know, you can't control the distractions throughout your day. So what the best kind of architecture for a workplace, what we found, is it's those workplaces that are creating spaces specific to the tasks that an employee needs to do throughout the day. So you can both have a collaborative space, but also a space to go on your own or in pairs to discuss things and also have time for a depth of thought. Because we can't really get to the good ideas in the world unless we have time to think. And to think needs lack of distraction and quietness. So what we found, if we can go to the answer page, is there's you know, architects out there that are specifically creating different spaces within workplaces. And those organisations also that offer flexible working, we found one interesting study um, from China, C-Trip is a travel agency and they have 16,000 employees. They implemented flexible working um, for their call centre, interestingly, and they saw that because employees were able to control their environment and have less distraction, I guess, within the home, um, they actually saw an increase of 13% on uh, productivity, which is and, interesting. Um, you know, that to me is kind of like a really staggering insight because as we move to kind of the customer experience and trying to digitise that and opening up more channels for customers to engage with, uh, with their companies, you know, big organisations are looking to reduce the cost to serve and, you know, call centres are kind of traditionally thought probably one of the key workspaces where you can't move employees, that they have to be within the call centre, they have to see their KPIs, they have to be with their team. So it's fascinating that actually this Chinese operation is seeing a huge shift in productivity by having their employees work from home. And obviously that would massively reduce the cost to serve for companies who are looking to engage more on digital channels but need to reduce their, their voice and other costs. So I think that's a real study to watch. Um, okay, ready for another question? So, well-being. Um, sorry, summer's over, so the sizzle's gone, and we're kind of now thinking about flu season. How can we help our employees feel protected and healthy at work? Again, a huge investment is made in this, particularly in organisations where you have factories, where you have your employees on shift work, um, absenteeism, sick leave, etc., are huge costs to human resource. Um, in fact, in the US, this market, wellbeing programs within organisations is $8 billion business. So we wanted to have a look at this and look at the impact on this. So I'd like you all to think about a study, um, and this organisation has invested very heavily in its wellbeing. We wanted to get a sense from you, what do you think the impact of this wellbeing program has been on its staff? So. Do we think we're going to see fewer sick days? Do you think you're more likely to stay with a company? Are you going to be more loyal? Are you going to move up better, more promotions? Are we going to see fewer hospital visits and less use of medication? Improvement in health behaviours, like going to, to the gym? All of these, none of these. Your answers, please. Wow, OK. You're getting faster. <laughs> Wonderful. So everyone is on board with a message at work. Good to know. <laughs> so uh, what we found from this particular study, and there aren't too many out there that are very comprehensive, so we can definitely, this is a study that we can take seriously, and it was very well executed. Um, and so it was 5,000 employees at the University of Illinois, and employees were offered weight management programs, smoking cessation, Tai Chi, 
um, and kind of trained on habits of how to deal with work stresses. And what the study found was that uh, they studied those people and they found that there was actually zero impact on sick days, zero impact on turnover, zero impact on medication use or hospitalisation. But it's not all bad. I promise, the $8 billion isn't all lost. The main reason for this is these programs often attract the people that are already interested in their own health and lifestyle. So instead of doing Matai Chi on Saturday, now work's paying for it and I'll go on Wednesday, thank you very much. So the idea with this is, and this is where behavioural science can come in, is the number one thing you need to do with a wellness program is focus on how do you target the people that wouldn't otherwise do it. How do you get those that don't believe or care or have the space to think about their health and well-being? And I think that's you know, the key point that we want to make here. We are huge advocates of positive employee experience, of reward and recognition, of these types of programs. We think they're really, really important. But when you're investing significant amounts of money and big organisations with huge populations are, it's really about thinking about where you are putting that investment, where are you strategically targeting that. And with big call centre populations or where you have a lot of shift workers, really thinking about the audience that you are communicating to and building your strategy around that so we don't want to get rid of massages at work but we want to make sure that we're really targeting in large-scale operations the right people in the right way all right so last one the last one so this is the kind last of big poll. one this is what we are kind of maybe asked to help organizations with most is how can we help our people through change Vicky how can we get our employee engagement score up here how can we do this you know team performance how can we make this team really vibe really flow etc so um, we do a lot of work in this space, very passionate about it, and as you know, as Thea said, we're very human beings, um, we're very social, we're the only species that really kind of rears its young right up to adulthood. We're very dependent on one another, and when you're working for sort of five days a week, 40 hours a week with your team, you really want to vibe with them, you really want to get on well. So what are kind of their criteria, what are the things that make a really productive team? So, here you go. Can you pick what the one thing that you think is most important? Is it having clear goals and rewards? Is it feeling safe and understood? Is it having an inspiring leader? Is it having dependable team members that won't let you down, that will do and deliver on the things that they say they will do? And is it or good communication skills? So are we able to talk and nut things out? All right, so we've got a nice mix there. Nobody thinks it's important to be dependable, so good to know. I, I trust all of you. Uh, and so what, I'm gonna share the last study of the day, and some of you may have seen this one before, but it was a very kind of foundational study in this space. So Google wanted to understand what made their great teams great. And they expected to find a particular ingredient that would be around the dynamics of the team. So when we're studying our people, we have to have one PhD, one coder, one introvert, one extrovert. And they'd expected by studying these teams that they could create a template that then they could kind of put across the whole organisation. But what they actually found by talking to 200 Googlers across two years is that it was particular behaviours, as we've outlined here, that made the difference. And although all of these were identified as important, the number one was feeling safe and understood. So we've got a lot of people in the room that understand this. What we call psychological safety. And the reason for that is we still kind of have this old brain and threats are really scary to us. So even like a passive aggressive email can feel like a lion, you know, chasing us in our physiology. So it's really important within the team that it doesn't feel I'm being criticized or that people are thinking bad things about me. I want my team to feel that I know that I'm competent and that I'm good at what I do so I don't have to protect myself. So it's those teams that are okay to ask questions, those teams that don't criticize each other, that within Google not only brought in the most revenue, not only you know, created the best work, but executives within Google um, were twice as likely to say that they were effective and efficient in their job. Great. So, we promise very quickly to give you our kind of like top five tips for um, a thriving workplace. Um, so, these are them. Uh, a four day week doesn't reduce productivity, but there is small print. It's there a very small, small study so far. 
Um, so, you know, let's all eyes on Amazon to, to look at that and let's see what kind of momentum Frances O'Grady gets behind her policies. Number two, making sure at work that you have space to be collaborative and also have private time, time where you can do your real thinking. And importantly, if you're going to offer a flexible work policy, research shows that, that will, you will see an increase in productivity in your teams as well if they know they have that, that option. And with, when it comes to wellness, make sure that you're really getting on board those people who wouldn't otherwise care about their health and wellness. And finally, kind of the key thing is really encouraging this sense of a team where everyone feels psychologically safe, where they feel their ideas are valued, where they're free to open and share and contribute. That really is the kind of one defining feature that will really help your teams thrive at work. So thank you, and thank you so much. We couldn't have done this without your help. Thank you. Thank you.